Well, hey, church, and wherever you are joining us today, uh, whether that's at your home or on a computer or a kind of wherever you're joining us online, man, our hope and prayer is that God would meet you where you are at. And so I just want to encourage you, man, to take some time to stand and worship with us. My failures and flaws 
Well, you've seen them all. You call me your friend. The God of the mountain. He's the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Nothing.
Hey church, as we continue to worship through our giving, uh, I just wanna encourage you, thank you for your generosity through this season, your faithfulness. Uh, you guys have been amazing. Uh, as always here at Life Church, man, there's a number of ways for you to give. One of those is online at lifechurchreno.com. You can just simply click the Give tab. Uh, you can also text any gift to the number 84321. And then we have a new way. It's called the Church Center app. So on any kind of smartphone, you can download the Church Center app. There you will create a profile. Uh, you'll uh, make yourself part of the Life Church Reno uh, campus. And then you can do everything from checking in stu or your kids or uh, uh, signing up for any events. Uh, giving is on there for its own separate tab. Um, and so I just wanna encourage you, download the Church Center app. It has all of your information, all the stuff you need to kind of continue you to be connected here at Life Church. So hey, why don't you grab a pen and a Bible and get ready as we join Pastor Dave as we dive into our new series. Well, hey, Life Church. Hey, before I get into this week's message, I do just wanna remind you that most of our life groups and classes begin meeting this week. So if you haven't yet joined the group, we've got groups for men, groups for ladies, groups that are co-ed, groups most every day of the week. We've got live groups, we've got digital groups. Sign up for a group today at lifechurchreno.com. At Life Church, listen, for us, it's so much more. Uh, being a part of, of the church is so much more than, than just going to a service. For us, it really is about relationships. And life groups are where that happens. And so if you're comfortable doing live, join a live group. If you're uh, still kind of hunkered down at home, join a digital group. Either way, join a group at lifechurchreno.com. They all begin meeting. The vast majority begin meeting this week. Well, hey, uh, if you are old enough, thank goodness I'm not, but if you're old enough to remember 1969, you might remember, and you've probably heard the song even since then. In 1969, John Lennon and Yoko Ono recorded a song called uh, Give Peace a Chance. Now, the big line, you might have heard it, all we are saying is give peace a chance. And, and that is the name of the series we're kicking off today. Uh, we're continuing through the book of Colossians, and we come to a verse in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, that is really our framework, our key verse for this series. Here's what it says. It says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. Let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. If there was ever a time for us to give peace a chance, it is now. Now, when we think about peace, we have all these different ideas. I'm not simply talking about um, like not being at war. When John Lennon and Yoko Ono recorded that song, it was in response to the Vietnam War. It became a a, a, uh, a rallying cry that that was was said over and over and over again through these Vietnam War protests. But that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, what I'm really talking about is so much more than that. And in this moment in particular, really. We're talking about anxiety and the stress and so much of what we're feeling. And really over the last 100 years, um, psychologists and sociologists have tracked, and what we've seen is this. Over the last 100 years, each successive generation has reported levels of anxiety and stress and depression at three times the previous generation. And, and, and so if you think about it, over the last 100 years, each generation has been significantly more stressed out and more anxious than the generation before. And, and we've even just in the last few years seen a significant increase year over year in 2018. Uh, there was a significant study done that was shown that the overall anxiety, there's actually this anxiety index that psychologists and sociologists look at. This, this anxiety index showed that, that year over year from 2017 to 2018, the, the anxiety index for Americans went up five, five points. Now that may not mean but much, but here's what means something. That out of that study, 39% of Americans in 2018 reported the same amount of anxiety that they'd had in 2017. But also 39% of Americans in 2018 reported feeling more anxiety than they had simply one year before. And then now in our moment, 
And, and now we enter in all that's happening in 2020. And I, I can't imagine what the data is going to look like when, when these same folks look at 2020 versus 2019, that the, and, and the exponential increase in anxiety. In fact, the data that's been taken so far, just snapshots in time through this challenging time, reports heartbreaking statistics. Let me share with you some of this. The CDC conducted a survey of 5,412 people between June 24th and June 30th, and they, and they, they collected data on people's levels of anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts. Get this, roughly 25% of young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 said they've considered suicide because of the effects of the pandemic. About 31% of the respondents said that they had had, quote, symptoms of anxiety or depression as a result of all that's going on in this time. And about 26.3% reported trauma and stress-related disorders caused by the outbreak. Over 13% reported that they had used alcohol, prescription, and or illegal drugs to deal with their pandemic-induced stress and anxiety. Get this, the amount of Americans reporting anxiety symptoms is triple the number of this time last year. The CDC reported that 11% of adults surveyed had seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days. And Dr. Robert Redfield, the director of the CDC, said this, that, that in, for young adults, we're seeing, sadly, far greater suicides than we are deaths from COVID-19. We're living in a, in a really a, a, a pandemic of anxiety. We're living in a pandemic of stress. We're living in a pandemic of depression. And so it's because of that that we're super excited that we're here in Colossians and, and God's word is talking about the stuff that we're facing every single day, this topic of peace. And so we're gonna dig deep into this over these next few weeks. Because here's the truth. God has a better way for us to live. It's not the heart of God that we would go through life stressed out. It's not the heart of God that we'd go through life with a low-level depression just because of everything going on around us. It's not God's heart that we would go through life just filled with anxiety. It's the heartbeat of God for you to go through life filled with, with a deep and residing sense of, of peace. And so we're going to talk about that today and over these next few weeks in this series. Here, here's the truth. Real peace is rarer than we think. Real, real peace, the peace that the Bible's talking about, it, it, it's less common than we would think. See, many times what we do is, is we mistake external comfort for internal peace. Obviously, we can have good feelings when everything around us is going well. Obviously, in those moments in life where we've got a bank account filled with money and our job's going great and our marriage is going great and our kids are being really easy to be around and everyone's treating us kindly and the economy's good and, and there's not a global pandemic and all of those things, and, 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 or you're on vacation or you're in a beautiful place, and those moments, it's easy for life to feel great. And so many times we think that that's what peace is about. And in fact, there was a professor who asked uh, the, the, his audience one day to just think to themselves, what, what does peace look like? To, to close their eyes and imagine peace. After a, a few seconds the audience was invited to share what their mind saw, these, these mental pictures of peace. Maybe even you, just for a moment, just might think, well, when you think about peace, what do you think about? One person described it as a field with flowers and beautiful trees. Another person spoke of snow-capped mountains and an incredible alpine landscape. Maybe for you, maybe for me, it's like thinking about Lake Tahoe on a beautiful day. Still another described the scene of a beautiful, still lake. After everyone described their mental picture of peace, there was one thing in common in them all. In each scenario, in each picture, there were no other people in them. See, many times when we imagine peace, we imagine ourselves alone in a beautiful place. 
And really what that is, is really what we're imagining is, is really more to do with external comfort or more to do with a perfect environment or a perfect scenario, really, than, than what the Bible would talk about as the peace of God. See, see, it's, it's more than a perfect environment. It's more than distraction. See, it's, it's more than distraction. It's more than numbing. Sometimes we, we, we substitute things for peace and then think that's what peace is. We, we think that that peace is entertainment. We, we think, you know, when, when we think about watching TV or watching movies, and, and there's nothing wrong in, in, the, in those things in themselves, but when they become our outlet for our, where, where we think we're going to get rid of our stress and instead have peace, we're fooling ourselves. And in fact, the, the word amuse literally means to not think. The word muse means to think. The A is the negative prefix. This amuse is, and we just think if I can just not think, think about all of the stress, then really it's going away. But but really, we're just distracting ourselves, or we're numbing ourselves with alcohol, or we're constantly looking for an escape. And we're constantly thinking, when can I go on that next vacation where I can escape my stress and my anxiety and all of the challenges in life? And in, and in doing so, we're, we're, really, we're really cheapening what peace is. Peace is so much more than that. It's more than simply numbing. It's more than a distraction. It's more than a perfect environment. The peace of God is so much more about what's going on inside of me than it is about what's going on around me. And so much more about what's going on inside of me than the world around me, the people around me, the circumstances that I'm in. It's so much more. And because of that, it allows me to be okay no matter what is going on in the world, no matter what's going on at home, no matter what's going on at work, no matter what's going on in the economy, no matter what's going on in a global health um, pandemic, the peace of God, allows me to be okay no matter what is going on around me because of who is inside of me. So peace is not only rarer than we think, peace is also much bigger than we think. See, peace is one of the key words of the Bible. It's one of the key themes of the Bible. In fact, we, we see the word peace over 400 times in the Bible. And, and, and in the Bible, peace is more than simply the cessation of hostilities. Peace is, is more than, than simply not being at war. So peace is more than simply not being stressed out all the time. Peace is, is more than simply harmony or tranquility. It's all of those things, but it's also so much more than those things. And the Hebrew, the word is shalom, which is a very common word in, in, in the Hebrew and in Jewish culture even today. So many times uh, Jewish people will greet one another and saying shalom on, on their Sabbath day, their Shabbat. A typical greeting would be Shabbat shalom, the peace of the Sabbath. And then in the Greek language, the, the Greek equivalent to shalom is this word irene. And so, and these words, shalom and irene, uh, speak of, uh, they do speak of cessation of hostilities. They do speak of not being at war. They do speak of not being stressed out. They do speak of harmony and tranquility. But really, it's so much more than simply that. See, really, in, in the Bible, that God's peace, this shalom, it meant wholeness. It meant completeness throughout all creation. It meant the end of injustice. It meant things being as they were intended to be and as they should be. Alvin Plantinga, who is thought of as, as, as one of, if not the most well-respected Christian philosopher alive today. In his book uh, called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be, uh, it's a book about the nature of sin. Here's what he said about Shalom. He says, what a wonderful word shalom is. It has all of the connotations of peace in English, but includes a whole lot more. It means not simply psychological ease, but a holistic sense of fulfillment, well-being, and flourishing. That kind of comprehensive shalom, peace, is what the Old Testament prophets like Isaiah envisioned for the future. They dreamed of a new age in which human crookedness would be straightened out. Rough places would be made plain. The foolish would be made wise and the wise humble. They dreamed of a time when the deserts would flower, the mountains would run with wine, weeping would cease, and people could go to sleep without weapons on their laps. 
People would work in peace and work to fruitful effect. Lambs could lie down with lions. All nature would be fruitful, benign, and filled with wonder upon wonder. All humans would be knit together in brotherhood and sisterhood. And all nature and all humans would look to God, walk with God, lean towards God, and delight in God. See, really in the Bible, this idea of peace, Shalom, Irene in the Greek, it really speaks of a time where everything would be made right and everything would be the way it's supposed to be. Jamie Ritchie, in her book, Vulnerable Faith, Missional Living in the Radical Way of St. Patrick, she said it this way, Shalom is what love looks like in the flesh, the embodiment of love in the context of a broken creation. Shalom is a hint at what was, and what should be, and what will one day be again. Where sin disintegrates and isolates, shalom brings together and restores. See, to live in real peace involves a number of things working all together at once, and they're all interrelated, and they all build on each other. And it really begins, first of all, where, where things are at are right or at peace between me and God. See, see, the peace that, that we're all looking for, it really begins with me being at peace with God, where things really are right between me and God. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans 5.1. He says it this way. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, all of us, because of our sin, whenever we sin, what we're doing is we're declaring war against God, saying, I want to be the king of my life, not you. But because of Jesus coming and dying in our place, taking the punishment, I deserve the punishment you deserve and his resurrection. Because of that, we have been made right with God. And, and so now everything's right. Now we're at peace with God. And the peace that we're all looking for, it really begins with peace with God. And so peace includes things being right with, with me and God. Peace includes things being right inside myself. That's, that's kind of the thing when we think about inner peace or, or, or getting rid of anxiety. A lot of times what we're thinking about is not worrying, not going through life stressed out, not going through life just in a constant state of fret. That's really what Jesus was talking about in, in Matthew 6 and verse 25. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. Here's the truth. The sin that, that most of us discount the most in our life and feel the most comfortable committing and the most comfortable talking about and the most comfortable admitting is the sin of worry. And, and we act like it's no big deal when I go through life worried about my kids or my finances, but really it's a big, big, big deal because every single time I worry, I'm saying, God, I don't trust you. I'm saying, God, I don't think you can handle it. I don't think you're big enough. I don't think you're strong enough. Or I don't think your character and intentions towards me are right and good and that you care. And so, so Jesus says, hey, this worry thing, it's a big deal. He says, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? What Jesus is saying is he's saying, listen, worry doesn't help. He says, God takes care of the bird. He's going to take care of you. You can trust him. Worry doesn't make anything better. It mostly just makes things worse. And so really this peace thing, it begins with peace with me and God. And then it's this inner peace, this state where I'm not going through life filled with anxiety and worry. So many people today in the midst of, of, of this coronavirus time, there's so many things to worry about. Am I going to get the sickness? Is someone else gonna, that I love going to get it? Is someone I love going to die? Am I going to die? Am I going to lose my job? Is the economy going to collapse? Who's going to win the election? What's going to happen after that? And because of that, so many of us are going through life with this incredible just inner anxiety, stress, and worry. And Jesus says, hey, listen, that's not how you're supposed to live. Your heavenly Father cares for you. Your worry's not helping anything. Trust your heavenly Father. And so there's this inner peace thing. 
And, and then there's this, this peace. When, when, I, when I'm experiencing the peace of God, there's peace where things really are right between me and others. See, listen, if I, if I have a whole bunch of broken relationships, a whole bunch of conflict in my life, and I try to tell myself that I'm at peace with God, I'm fooling myself. These things are directly connected. Here's what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 17. He said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, this is a powerful truth that will improve every relationship you have. He says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. What Paul's saying is this, some people, no matter how kind you are, some people, no matter if you apologize a hundred times, so many people, no matter how much you humble yourself time after time after time, some people are gonna be determined to not be at peace with you. But if there's a break in any relationship, make sure it's not on you. He says, as far as it's up to you, you apologize, you humble yourself, you love and you forgive and forgive and forgive. As far as it's up to you. Live at peace with everyone. See, the peace of God begins with peace with God, and then it's peace in me, and then that flows to every single relationship I have. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. He says, God will take care of it. Then he skips down. He says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And so this thing where, where the peace of God, it means that, that things are right, but, but things are at peace between me and others. And then here's the next thing. The peace of God means that I'm joining God in his work in the world until that day where everything becomes right. That's that big idea of shalom, wholeness, where everything is as it, as it was supposed to be in the garden, everything as, is as it should be, and then everything is as it one day will be when God makes everything right. And, and so because I've experienced the peace of God, now God invited me in on his mission to spread that peace. And so, so, so more and more people are at peace with God. That's what Jesus was praying when he taught us to pray. He said, said, pray, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so as followers of Jesus that have experienced his peace, we are spreading his peace. We're joining in God's work in the world until one day God will make everything absolutely right. We are his agents here on earth, spreading his kingdom until that time when everything will be made right. The Isaiah 11 as he was prophesying of that time that where there will be this ultimate shalom, this ultimate peace, this wholeness, where everything wrong is right. He, he, he talks about it in Isaiah 11. He says it this way. He says, the wolf will live with the lamb the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together. He says it's a world where there's no violence, not even among animals. And he says, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobras. And he's speaking of this time where, where even ju just natural disasters and no one gets hurt by animals, where everything that's wrong, every, everything that's wrong in the world is made right. And the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. Get this, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Here's what Isaiah is talking about. Isaiah is talking about that same thing that Jesus is talking about in the book of Revelation where Jesus says that he will wipe away every tear from every eye and there will be no more sickness and no more sadness and no more crying and no more dying because Jesus is making all things new. We look to that moment where everything that's wrong in the world, everything that's been broken because of sin, everything wrong is made right, and Jesus is making all things new. And so this peace of God, it means that I have peace with God. It means that I have peace inside myself. I'm not going through life with anxiety and worry because I trust in God's goodness and his character. I have peace in my relationships. Things are right in my relationships, and I'm spreading this shalom, this peace of God joining in on God's mission in the world until that time when he makes all things right. Here's the last thing and we're done. The path to peace is simpler than we think. 
Now listen, over these next few weeks, we're gonna get real practical. We're gonna dig deep on this peace thing. But, but really, experiencing peace in your life begins by connecting to the God of peace. See, God is so passionate that you would go through life experiencing his peace. God is so passionate that you would go through life free from anxiety and stress and worry. God is so passionate that you would go through life where things really are right, right with you and him, right inside of you, right with others, working until all things are right in this world. God's so passionate for that. It actually is one of the names of God. God is described as Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. We see it over and over again. We see it at many places. We, in, in Romans 15, Paul tells the, the church, he said, may the God of peace be with you all. 2 Corinthians 13, 11, he says it this way. He said, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. And then Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. And so God is described as the God of peace. We see this peace thing as a prominent theme in the life of Jesus. So Jesus, as his birth is prophesied in the book of Isaiah, it says this, you've heard this at Christmas time, Isaiah 9, 6. It says, for unto us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And then we see it at his birth in Luke chapter two. It says, suddenly a great crowd of angels showed up, and they said, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. See, it's this theme. We see it in the prophecy of Jesus' birth in Isaiah. We see it at his birth. And then right before Jesus is about to die, he says to his disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He says it's not the kind of peace the world gives. The kind of peace the world gives is temporary. It's based on external comfort. It's based on circumstances. It's based on what's going around. He says the peace I'm giving you is going to be different. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. He says, I'm giving you real peace. And then the, we see a theme of the resurrection. after. So Jesus, before he dies, says, I'm giving you peace. And then the very next message he has after he rises from the dead, he's before his disciples, he says this. He, he stands among them and in John 20, 19, he says, peace be with you. And he showed them his hands and his feet, and then he says it again. He says, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And then a few verses later, when he first sees Thomas, who had doubted his resurrection, his very first words to Thomas are, peace be with you. And so peace is, in, is, is, is God's name. Peace is this, is this overriding theme and message of, of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. And the Holy Spirit, when we learn about, about the fruit of the Spirit, the character of Christ in our lives, when Paul says, hey, these are the marks of someone who's living a life controlled by the Holy Spirit, where Christ's character is being manifest, he says the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love and joy and peace. And so the path to peace begins by connecting with the God of peace. So I wonder in this time, now, where are you at with the God of peace? Maybe you've never come to a point in your life where you've begun a personal relationship with the God of peace through Jesus. Maybe you've, maybe you've done some religious stuff. Maybe you haven't. Maybe this is the first time you've even heard about this. And so maybe you say, you know what? I don't even think I have a relationship with the God of peace, but I'd like to. Moment I'm gonna give you an opportunity to. Or, or maybe you'd say, you know what? Man, there's been times in my life where I felt closer to the God of peace than I do right now. Maybe what's happened to you is what I think has happened to so many of us, is that in this crazy, crazy time, our natural instinct and the messages that we hear from every source are for us to take our eyes off the God of peace and place them on the pandemic and place them on the economy, and place them on the politicians, and place them on all of these other things. And, and, and when we do that, what happens is the pandemic gets big, and God gets small, and my anxiety goes through the roof. 
or the or, or, or the government looks big or and God looks small and my anxiety goes through the roof or, or my financial problems look big and God looks small and my anxiety goes through the roof and I wonder for you, if this is a moment for, for you to say, you know what, I'm done looking at the pandemic as my primary focus because it doesn't bring me peace. It can't help me. I'm done looking at the government and the politicians and President Trump and Vice President Biden and who's going to win. I'm done looking at that as the source of my peace because it doesn't bring peace. It brings anxiety. I'm done looking at the stock market or the job reports or what's going on in my workplace as my source of peace. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn my focus to the God of peace that I might experience peace with him and peace inside of me, peace in every relationship, and that I'm might join him on his mission to spread his peace, this thing where everything is right in the world as it ought to be, and one day will be. I'm going to join in in his work in the world. So why don't we pray together? Hey, listen, if you have never come to a spot where you've really begun a personal relationship with Jesus, but there's something inside of you right now, for some of you, there's something inside of you saying, this is what you need to do. There's something saying, this is true, and this is what you need. I wanna give you an opportunity to do that. I wanna give you an opportunity to become a follower of Jesus, to give your life to Christ. Because here's the truth, that, that, that God sent his son Jesus so that we might have peace with him. Jesus left heaven, came to earth, lived a perfect life. He lived the life that, that we should have lived but can't live. He lived a life where he never messed up. He never, never did the wrong thing. And then he died the death that I deserve to die, that you deserve to die because of our sin. The Bible says that because of our sins, that, that we've declared war against God and that we all deserve to die because of our sins. And in fact, actually because of our sins, apart from Christ, we're already spiritually dead. But Jesus died the death I should have died. Taking the punishment I deserve for my sin, the punishment you deserve for your sin. And then he rose from the dead, conquering our greatest source of anxiety so that we would never have to fear what's gonna happen after we die. That because Jesus rose from the dead, all of us who trust in him one day will rise from the dead. And this truth frees us from our greatest source of stress and anxiety. So maybe, you're hearing this today and you say, that's what I need to do. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do it. It's really less about words you say and really mo most about what's going on in your heart, but you could pray something like this. God, thank you for loving me so much that you sent Jesus to die in my place. And God, I believe that Jesus is your son. And I believe that he took the punishment that I deserve. And I believe that he rose from the dead and God, I don't wanna keep living life doing my own thing with me in charge, but God, I want to follow Jesus and live life on his terms for the rest of my life. And so God, even right now, would you come and live inside of me and control me with your Holy Spirit? And I wonder if there's others of you who say, you know what, I know I know that I've given my life to Jesus in the past, but in this season, I think my propensity has been to, to look at everything else other than Him. And so, Father, for all of us, I think that's most of us, if not all of us, we just confess our propensity is to look at everything else other than you. Our propensity is to look at what's going on with coronavirus and the government and politics and the economy and all of the things. But God, we just confess that, that you are our source of peace. And so we turn our eyes to you. And so we say, God of peace, would you fill us with your peace? May your peace flow through us into every relationship. And might we partner as your agents, spreading your peace, your shalom in, into all of the world until that moment where you ultimately make all things right. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man, what an amazing word from Pastor Dave today. 
Hey, if you decided to uh, make that decision to follow Jesus for the rest of your life and you made that decision for the first time today, we would love to pray with you and maybe have a pastor get in contact with you, maybe talk about next steps, but we are so excited for you and the step that you made today and we rejoice and celebrate that moment with you. For all things kind of happening here at Life Church, I want to let you know to follow us on social media, on our Facebook, on our Instagram, uh, also on the Church Center app where you can also find out everything that's happening here at Life Church. As Pastor Dave mentioned at the beginning of the message, we have life group signups happening. If you go to our website and you can click on, on our life groups and click on our signups, and we have uh, ones that are meeting in person. We have ones meeting virtually through Zoom. We have classes that are being offered online and in person. So I wanna encourage you, man, There's this Christian life is not meant to be done alone. So I wanna encourage you to find a way to connect however you're comfortable during the season, whether that's in person or virtually online. We we have options for you and we would love for you to be connected with us as we continue to do uh, the Christian life and walk this out together. If you have any prayer requests, church, I, I encourage you, email them to prayer at lifechurchreno.com. We love you. We miss you. We are praying for you. God bless. Thank you.